Well, good morning to you all this morning. Uh, it's good to be together, uh, not physically, of course, uh, but through the internet, uh, through our website. Hopefully, you're tuning in through YouTube. Uh, there are some of us here. You can't see them, which is probably not a bad thing in some ways because Matt's here. Uh, and we have Daniel on piano. Uh, we have Ailes who will be singing. And of course, we've got Brandon is the man behind all the digital stuff. I was just lamenting to others that um, in our kids' song today, I think it's My God is So Big, that has actions. What a pity Mr. Brad wasn't with us today. And we could have got him up here to do the actions for us. Anyway... Matt will do his best to do that, and he'll lead the kids' talk. So, uh, just a couple of announcements. One is, uh, obviously, we're in lockdown. Uh, it's it's going gonna, it's gonna to roll like this for weeks and months, on and off. We're going to have to just work through it. Uh, you might be able to get speak to your... Uh, it's, so, it's the refresh groups this week. So, speak to your refresh leaders. Probably be able to meet together via Zoom or whatever digital format you're going to use. But just contact with them. My, my LTG group, which meets on Thursday, we were planning to meet to a book review. We won't do that, uh, but I'll send out an email, and then we'll meet the following where we'll review all the sermons of the guys who've preached. Uh, I'm going to leave all the rest of the intimations. Oh, just one other thing is we did ask for help for cleaning out Bob's place next Saturday. I'll send an email out that during the week. I'm not sure we'll be able to do that under the lockdown, but... I'm just seeking some clarification. So just for those who've volunteered uh, to help, I'll send out an email and let you know what's going on. Well, I'm going to call you to worship from uh, Isaiah 44. Uh, and if you, if you have opportunity after church, once you read through Isaiah 44, but particularly from verse 9, where it's talking about the folly of idolatry and how, you know, obviously back in the day, uh, a bloke would get a piece of wood, cut it in half, and uses half the wood to split it and to make a fire so he can burn it and cook things. And then the other half, he makes an idol and he worships it. And essentially, Isaiah's mocking them. So you worship the very things that you burn. And then when you get to down to verse 21, you get this juxtapose where he says, but the Lord, the Lord is actually our true God, our true Redeemer. Here's from verse 21. Remember these things, O Jacob and Israel, for you are my servants. I formed you. You are my servant. O Israel, you will not be forgotten by me. I have blotted out your transgressions like a cloud and your sins like mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Sing, O heavens, for the Lord has done it. Shout, O depths of the earth, break forth into singing, O mountains, O forests, and every tree in it. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and will be glorified in Israel. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, who formed you from the womb. I am the Lord who makes all things, who alone stretched out the heavens and spread out the earth by myself. Let's, um, let's pray. And we'll seek God's blessing upon us as our Redeemer. Father, we thank you as we gather this morning in uh, lockdown context that we're mindful that you're sovereign over all these things. That you've been reminded from Isaiah, you are the God who formed us, the God who keeps us, the God who redeems us. Indeed, the one who created all things by the power of your word and sustains all things by that very word, Jesus Christ. So as we gather this morning, would you be pleased to bless us in our various places? We ask that you would remind us of Jesus Christ and the gospel, that you would uh, drill down into our hearts and minds that we might be very clear that we are redeemed by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and that he has taken away our sins and they are forgotten and remembered no more. And so we can gather before your throne with a boldness this morning. Would you bless us, forgive us, cleanse us? And even though online worship is a shadow of the Lord's day, we pray that you will still powerfully work in it and through it for your glory and for the building up of your church and the forgiveness of many souls. 
For we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to uh, sing our first song of praise. Let's stand. We'll sing together. All sit, which you'll be doing at home. Uh, this life I live. children. My name's Mr. Horman. I hope you can all see me at home. It's good to see you this morning, sort of. You can see me. I can't see you, but it's good to see you. It's good to be with you guys. We're going to do the catechism this morning, um, and we're going to continue in our story of who we are, who God is, and um, we're going to... It's a bit of a sad story today, actually. We're continuing in this, this tragic uh, part of the story today. But first... But first, we've got to do some revision. We've got to remind ourselves of who God is and what God is like. So let's do some revision questions. We know that God made you. We know that God made your parents. We know that God made your grandparents. What else did God make? Now, can you, can you yell it out from home? So he made you. What else has God made? He did. He made all things. Excellent. I even maybe heard a Combridge from the back. Excellent. Uh, so God made you. He made all things. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, why should you... Let me get the question up so it's right. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a proper question. Why did God make you in all things for his own glory? Why should you glorify God? That's a revision question. That's number five. Why should you glorify God this morning and every day? Because he made you and he takes care of you. He made me and he takes care of me. So we can glorify him this morning and every day because that, he looks after us. 
God is good. So the first thing we know about God is he's big. He's really big. He made you and he made everything. And we know he's good. He takes care of you. He loves you. All right. So that's part of our revision. Another part of our revision this morning. Who were our first parents? Who were our first parents? They were Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. Excellent. You guys, I'm sure, are shouting it all out at home. Wonderful. And God made a promise. He made a covenant with Adam and Eve, didn't he? What's a covenant? Can anyone remember the covenant word? It's an agreement. Between, uh, maybe two oh, wonderful. We've got an answer. It's an agreement between two or more people. Excellent. Okay. So God made this promise with Adam and Eve. Hey, if you, I'll put you in the garden. And if you um, obey me, don't eat of the fruit of this tree, I'll give you life. Okay. And he's, making, he's made them. He takes care of them. And he's promised them life if they obey. What does God promise if they disobey? What does God promise if they disobey? Well, if they sin, God threatens Adam with death if he disobeys. So he promises good, but he says, hey, if you break this agreement, uh, there will be death. So did Adam keep this agreement? Did he keep this covenant? No, he, boom, boom, he sinned. And so last week, Mr. Middleton, he talked about um, why Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit, why they did the boom, boom. Can anyone remember why they, why they ate the forbidden fruit, why they sinned? Because they did not believe what God has said. They did not trust that God was a good God. They did not trust that his promises were true. Well, Today we come to the part of the story where we sort of look at how they didn't trust, why they didn't trust. And it involves this thing. I hope you can see it at home. All right, it's an ugly sock snake, okay? Now, it's dressed in black so that we know it's a villain, okay? Villains, baddies, they often dress in black, don't they? If you remember, if you've ever seen Star Wars, like Darth Vader or something like that, okay? So, spoiler alert, he's not a good snake, okay? Who tempted Adam and Eve to not believe God? Well, Eve was in the garden and the devil, as a snake, said to Eve, Really? Actually? Do you actually believe God's promises? That's what the devil says. He says, hey, God's promised something. God's promised something, but those promises aren't true. Those promises aren't good. And so Eve is tempted to eat the fruit. And she then gives it to Adam to eat the fruit because the devil encourages, he lies, he deceives, encourages people to disbelieve the promises of God. And so this morning, children, we don't listen to lies about the promises of God. We say, actually, we know God is good. We know his promises are true. But unfortunately, we're at the part of the story where Adam and Eve are still believing the devil as a snake. And so the question this morning is, who tempted Adam and Eve to this sin of eating the fruit? Can you remember the answer? The devil tempted Eve and she gave the fruit to Adam. So what we're about to do after I pray is we're about to sing about how our God is big, like what Mr. Middleton was talking about earlier. We've got actions, our God is big, right? Strong and mighty. And so as we sing that, we can go, yeah, he is big and he is good and he promises us things in Jesus and those things are good and true. And so we can trust them this morning, not believe the lies that the, the snake told Eve and Adam. Let me pray for you kids this morning. Father God, we thank you that you are a God that promises us things and you are true to those promises. We thank you that you are a big God who made us and made our world. And we thank you, God, that you are a God that cares for these children. Thank you, God, that you love us. 
And we pray, Lord, that we would trust in your promises this morning and not listen to lies about you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we sing this morning, remember to do the actions at home. Elsa and I will be doing the actions. We're off camera, but you guys can do them at home. Remember, big, strong, mighty. Let's do it. So strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. The rivers are His, the mountains are His, the stars are His handiwork too. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. Well done, everyone. I'm sure you were doing those actions at home. Change of pace now as we move into our reading for this morning. We're going to be reading from Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 to 11. So if you've got your Bibles at home, you can open it there, but the words will be on the screen as well. So Philippians chapter 2. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. We have our second reading, uh, which comes from Mark's Gospel. But I just want to orientate you to what we're doing here. So we're in our fourth week on a series of the diaconate. Um, deacons are just servants, so servants of the church. And we've been working through where it started in Acts, uh, where it find the qualifications in, in Timothy. Um, and what we want to do today is we want to finish by talking about uh, the very nature of who we're trying to reflect. So, so remember what we did, we broadened it out. We did, there's an office called deacons, and there's some who excel in service, and they're, they're the ones who want to elect as deacons, but we're all called to be deacons. We're all called to be servants, and we're called to be servants by the gospel because Christ has modeled that to us. It is the way of the kingdom. And so that's what we want to be able to camp on today. I'm going to look at, we're going to read verses, uh, Mark 10, verses 32 down to 45. I'm going to concentrate in the last few verses, but we'll work through all the text just so that we get a, a good context of what's going on. So this is the word of the Lord. And they were on the road going to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them, and they were amazed, and those who follow them were afraid and talking Taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles, and they will mock him and spit on him and flog him 
and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Or to be baptized with a baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left hand is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be the first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Well, let's uh, we'll pray, and then we'll seek God's blessing upon his word. Father, we uh, thank you for this portion of Mark's gospel. Uh, it's texts which we're very familiar with. Uh, how we pray, though, that your, your spirit will work in and through us, through the preaching of your word, so that it will come to us with a freshness and a conviction, so that we might hear the Spirit of God say, this is the way, walk in it. For we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, a lot of you younger folk probably won't even know this movie you heard about. It's a movie back in the 90s. But there's a movie called White Men Can't Jump. It's a, it's a comedy. And there's uh, Wesley Snipes. He, he plays this character called Sidney Dean. And he's with his friend, um, Billy Hoyle, who's, who's actually played by Woody Harrelson. And anyway, they're, they're in a car, open-top car, with the girlfriend, traveling into New York, and, and Harrelson takes a tape and he puts it into the stereo. That's right, it's a tape because it's, it's 1992. And, and so he puts this tape in and he starts listening to Purple Haze by Jimi Hendrix. Now, Snipes' ca character, he's sitting in the back seat. And he's not well pleased because in his mind, Hendrix was a black artist making music for black people. And so here is this white guy, even though it's his friend, this white guy playing Jimi Hendrix, and in his mind, that's not right. And so as he puts the tape in and starts listening, Dean says to him, what are you doing? And Billy responds, I'm, 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 I'm listening to Jimi Hendrix. And then Dean explodes. He says, look, man, you can listen to Jimmy, but you can't hear him. There's a difference. Just because you're listening to him doesn't mean you're hearing him. Now, there's actually a funny scene that follows that when the girlfriend points out that actually the rhythms and string sections of Jimi Hendrix were actually white guys. But anyway, I want to distract because that ruins the point. Here's the point. As it is with white men and Jimi Hendrix, so it is with Jesus and disciples. I mean, they can listen to Jesus, but it's obvious from the text that they're not hearing him. So you know how Mark's gospel works? Uh, first eight chapters is all about identifying who Jesus is. All the miracles, all the expressions of power, all these things are signs pointing to who he is. And then when you get to Mark chapter 8, and you get to uh, verse 29, finally, 
Jesus is pressing the disciples and he says, you know, who do people say I am? And they're telling them, oh, some say you're a prophet, some say this, some... And he goes, no, no, but who do you say I am? And then Peter, speaking on behalf of everyone, says, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You, you are the promised one. And then in Mark's gospel from chapter 8, verse 30 onwards, Jesus turns his face to Jerusalem because now they know who he is now they're going to find out about what he is here to do. And he turns towards Jerusalem. And then the whole conversation, in fact, the rest of Mark's gospel is about unpacking how Jesus is going to lay down his life as a ransom. And so what you get in Mark 8.31 is the very first time Jesus actually, he foretells, he, 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 he explains to them, you need to understand the Messiah will lay down his life. And then when you get into chapter 9, verse 30, he again speaks about his coming death and resurrection. He's warning them. And then when you get to our text, you get the most explicit, most explicit text in verses 32 to 34, where Jesus lays it out to them, what it's going to look like when he gets to Jerusalem. He talks in detailed way about his arrest, his mockery, the, the trial. He's spat on. He's beaten. He will be hung on a cross and then he will rise from the dead. And so here is Jesus and he's, he's telling them these things. And if you were to jump down to chapter 11 in Mark's gospel, just about to enter Jerusalem for the last time. So the whole, from chapter 11 onwards, this is it. This is where everything he's foretold about his, his arrest, his death, and his resurrection, it's all going to unfold now in these coming weeks. But the trouble is the disciples have been listening to Jesus, but they're not hearing him. And the evidence for that is in our text, by the way, James and John respond. The two brothers come to Jesus and they say to him, hey, Jesus, we want you to do us a favor, to do what we want. And, and, and he says, well, what is it that you want? He said, we, we, we really, really like places of privilege in your kingdom, in your glory. We want to sit at your right and your left. You see, those who long for the Messiah in Israel, there were some who expected when the Messiah would come that, that what he would do is he would restore, literally restore, David's physical kingdom. This was going to be David's greater son. And so you'd get the, the Jerusalem reign restored in all of its glory, which by implication meant you'd be overthrowing some Romans. You'd be getting rid of some Gentiles. In other words, Jesus as, as king... That, that, that he would lead some sort of rebellion. There are others, though, maybe not quite convinced of that, but, but they believe when the Messiah would come, at the very least, he would reform the corrupt system of worship in the temple, that he would, that he would address the Sadducees and their liberalism, and that the temple worship might be restored to its former place of glory. And so when the brothers come to Jesus, they have something of this in mind. They're expecting that Jesus will be glorified and his glory will look something like a kingdom and it will come with a certain amount of power. And so they come to him and say, listen, we want to sit at your right and left. Because though they had listened to Jesus, they had not heard him. Jesus has just finished explaining for the third time it's the cross before the crown. It's atonement before enthronement. He's just been laying out in chapter 8, chapter 9, and again in chapter 10, our verses. He's just told them everything that's going to unfold about his arrest, his trial, his suffering, his death and resurrection. And they listened, but they did not hear. I don't know if you can feel the weight of it, but you ought to. Jesus has just literally finished telling them, just took a breath, just said, 
guys, when I go to Jerusalem, this is what's going to happen to me. This is what they're going to do to me. And no longer has he finished telling this, this what must have been a massive burden for him. James and John, first thing they do is not, wow, how can that be? Can we sit at your right and your left? Because they're listening, but they're not hearing. And it's not just awkward, it's actually a disconnect. It's a disconnect. I've just been telling you about my suffering, and then your response to all my suffering is, can we sit at your left and right? Sort of like when I'm out with my wife in public, and <coughs> pardon me, and she'll say something to me. I know she said something, I heard something, probably might have seen her lips move, something like that. But to be honest, I've got no idea what she actually said. And sometimes I'll just distract. But other times, feeling bold, I'll take a stab at what I think she said. And my normally go-to saving line is, I love you too, babe. And then she says, I didn't say I loved you. And in public, that's when it sort of gets awkward from there. Well, that's what it's like in our text. There's a disconnect. Jesus is saying, this is what it looks like for the Messiah to bring in the glory. He will have to suffer and die and be raised again. And the disciples can't hear him. And so they say, oh, something about your glory. Well, can we sit your right and left? And in verse 38, Jesus said to them, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? That is, do you not understand that the cup of suffering that I must drink, do you not understand that the baptism of death that, that surely awaits, do, do you, have you not yet fully comprehended how it is the kingdom of God will come? Because it comes through my obedience in suffering and death. And in the resurrection. And they said to him, We are able. Now Jesus doesn't hit him with the hard home truth right there and then. He saves it for a few chapters to get to chapter 14. And then he warns him in advance, said, Listen, you say that you are able, you, 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 you apparently have resolved that you are willing to suffer for my name, but he warns them. When the hour comes, they will all disappear. They will all turn. They will all run. They will all abandon him. Look at verses 39 and 40. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. So here's Jesus uh, gently rebuking them. Yet he also affirms that, that to follow the suffering servant, the servant must be willing to suffer. Indeed, that's what the disciples after Pentecost come to realize. In fact, as we know from history, all but one, all suffer a death for the gospel. I think it's only John is the only one that had a, a natural death, and even that wasn't easy. Verse 41 says, And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. So they're, they're indignant, they're, they're, they're angry, or they're beginning to get angry. But, but not because James and John listened but didn't hear. Not, not because James and John, by asking him the sort of questions that they asked, they were thinking more like Gentiles than Jesus. Not, not because they have misunderstood the very nature and ethics of the kingdom. No, no, the other disciples are indignant because these blokes have tried to get a jump on them. <laughs> and, and so they're angry and they've taken offense. I mean, who do the sons of Zebedee actually think that they are? Well, why would they deserve places of honour and not, for example, us? 
And so the disciples amongst themselves are now not pleased. So Jesus calls them to himself and he said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. And what Jesus does now, he gets to the very heart of the issue. The question isn't, isn't who deserves the best two seats? The question really is, whose voice do you hear? We say it again, the disciples themselves, amongst themselves, they're having a debate about who is the most deserving of the two best seats. And Jesus calls them together and he says to them, the reason why you're having that debate is because though you listen to my voice, you are not hearing it. Because you're too busy hearing the voice of your culture about identity and success and fulfillment and power. The culture says you seek power and you use power and you do it for your own benefit and for the benefit of those whom you love. That's how you wield power in the world. That's how you wield power in the flesh. Because lots of money buys lots of things, lots of influence, influences lots of things. That's why the default position of culture, of the flesh, of the world, the default position is to always harness money and influence for yourself and for those whom you love. And out of the excess, maybe deal with others. That's how you secure the, the best spouses or the best schools or the best homes or the best jobs or the best life. And Jesus said, that's how the Gentiles think. That's how the world thinks. That's how the education system sets us up to think. That's how our culture colonizes us to think. That we might leverage our privilege so that we can lord it over others. And Jesus rebukes them. Not so among you. Not in my church, not in my kingdom, not amongst my people, he says. That's not how we roll. That's not how we do things. That's not how we live life. And so Jesus takes this opportunity, the teaching opportunity, to offer them a different vision, a different way of seeing and doing life, where greatness is actually seen in service, where, where honour is always preceded by humility. Where to be first of all is a willingness to be last of all. And he's, he's teaching them by paradox that upside down kingdom of God. There's a great old Puritan prayer, the valley of the vision. Let me, you've heard it numerous times. Let me remind you again. The writer says, let me learn by paradox the way of your kingdom. That the way down is the way up. To be low is to be high. To be broken heart is a heal heart. A contrite spirit is a rejoicing spirit. A repenting soul, a victorious soul. To have nothing to possess all. To bear the cross is to wear the crown. To give is to receive. As he just keeps listing all these paradox, he then says, and it's in that, he says, let me find my light. In my darkness, your life in my death, your joy in my sorrow, your grace in my sin, and your riches in my poverty. He says that's the way of Christ's kingdom, where greatness is seen in service, and honor is always preceded by humility, and the first of all must be willing to be last of all. Because this is this paradox is seen and modeled in Jesus the Christ. where the eternal entered time and the invisible took on flesh and the immortal tasted death and the king of kings lived and died as a servant of all. 
Now look at verse 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Where best do you see this paradox is is actually on the cross. The cross is, is in one sense, the the greatest paradox. That three o'clock on a Thursday afternoon. And it's the middle of the day. But all of a sudden becomes as dark as the middle of night. And, and, and here is, in a sense, as they're mocking and spitting and rejecting the one who's come to save them, humanity's darkest hour, by way of paradox, actually reveals the divine love that shines brighter than any time in human history. And as the one who is abandoned in death is the one who redeems humanity and now welcomes them in life. In weakness, he hung. But in power he's raised. And what seems like a crushing defeat, in fact, is God's greatest victory. As Matt reminded us in the words from Philippians 2, because he veiled his glory in human flesh and he humbled himself even to death on a cross. So the one who's rich, paradox, became poor. The one who is truth, condemned by lies. The one who is righteous is judged to be a sinner. And you see, this is kingdom life. It's a kingdom of paradoxes. And it's a kingdom that has come, but it's not yet fully realized. And yet, in Christ's church, where you see the kingdom operate, in your lives, in your homes, in your priorities in your giving, in your service, in your worship, what we get is these glimpses of that coming kingdom. We get this foretaste of what it's like to live in a kingdom where those who would be greatest are servants of all. Because when we're at our best as the church, when, when, when Christ's voice is heard in our midst, then our lives become shaped by these paradoxical truths of the kingdom. And we not only believe, but we teach our kids, our congregants, that the poor are rich, the weak are strong, and the meek shall inherit the earth. And we don't just, they're not just throwaway lines, we actually believe this. In our weakness, we actually believe his strength. And in our meekness, in our self-restraint, we believe that he will deliver. And that's why when you get to the New Testament epistles and the gospel is outlined and then it says, well, these are the implications, then, then, then in the church, in, in this paradoxical kingdom of Christ, you've got masters who are slaves, you've got rulers who are servants, and and leaders are all followers. We're, We're all Christians, not just some, not just most, but all Christians are deemed servants, deacons of sorts, because we're meant to reflect Christ in his paradoxical kingdom. Listen, if you have heard anything of Christ's voice in these last four weeks, then you will know that in Christ's kingdom, it's actually about God and others. It's about living your life for your spouse and your kids and for your neighbours and your friends. It's about kindness and love. It's about humility and service. It's about forgiveness and grace. That's the kingdom. And that is in contrast to a world that shouts at you and tells you and reminds you and models for you. Listen, it's about you. It's about creating your identity, finding your happiness, getting some sort of sense of fulfillment. So you have these endless voices that compete for your attention because our culture never, ever, ever stops trying to colonize us. And as celebrities allure and careerism devours and commercials promise and credit cards enable, Make no mistake, your culture 
the culture we live in is constantly seeking to colonize us, constantly telling you it's about your hopes and your dreams and your successes and your happiness and your, your retirement and your holidays. And so we live in this world of competing voices, installing competing visions from competing kingdoms. And it's really important that we don't just listen, but we hear Christ's voice on servanthood. So that the church is a glimpse of that kingdom. When people come into our midst and come into our homes, they get a glimpse of that paradoxical kingdom. Where it's about kindness and not glory and giving and not receiving and meekness and not power, service, not recognition. Humility, not acknowledgement. And so as servants of Christ and as deacons of sorts, you ask yourself the question this morning after this last month, thinking about the diaconate, thinking about servants, thinking about the implications of the gospel for ourselves and how we live, and you ask yourself the question, to whose voice am I attuned to? It'd be a great question, not just for the adults, but for the young people. Whose voice do you hear loudest? What unspoken terms are you living out your life? Have you not only listened, but have you heard what Christ has said on servanthood? How in his kingdom, the way down is the way up. To be low is to be high. A broken heart a healed heart, a contrite spirit, a rejoicing spirit. But where is in his kingdom to give is actually to receive. Because if you have heard his voice, then you will find your life in his death and your joy in his sorrow, your riches in his poverty, your freedom in his commands. And greatness is seen in being a servant of all. Amen? Then let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we find Christ's words confronting because the truth be known, we struggle with pride and we, we are colonized by our culture and we're constantly trying to etch out a, 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 a piece of glory for ourselves, some sort of acknowledgement, some sort of status, some sort of identity that will make us feel important and loved and successful. Because we hear the clamoring voices of our culture. And yet we hear your voice. And it convicts us. It convicts us of the way of your kingdom. So that we my purpose in our hearts as the people of God to live lives shaped by those paradoxical ethics of Jesus Christ. And that we might embrace the life of a servant in our homes and in our workplaces and in the church, not clamoring for acknowledgement and greatness, but loving and serving one another our neighbours, our enemies, our friends. I'll give to us that heart. That heart of the servant who came and offered his life as a ransom for many. For we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, we're going to respond to God's word and we'll do that as we uh, sing our next song of response, which is the servant king. Oh, 
Let's continue to respond to uh, the word this morning in prayer together. Let's pray. Father God, Father God, hear our prayers this morning. Thank you that we can approach you and speak to you, our holy, loving, wise God. Thank you that you are holy and great. Thank you that our uh, our meekness, our uh, smallness before you is, is changed by the gospel, the grace that you have shown us. May we uh, approach with confidence before you this morning, but also in fear. We thank you, God, for Jesus, and we thank you that we could hear your word this morning, sing praises to you this morning, praising your son, praising his servanthood, praising the paradox that is the gospel. Thank you for your plans and for your goodness, your sovereignty that, that shows us that in the cross there is the crown. We pray, Lord, that we would be more like Jesus. By your spirit, change us to be more like him, we pray. Expose in us the selfishness, the pride, the one-upmanship that we have in us. 
May our words, our actions, our habits be shaped by the gospel and the humility that comes with that. May we be humble to admit to our pride, our sinfulness. May we repent of it this morning. We do repent of it this morning, God. May we turn away from that and become servants ourselves, those that would love well. Help each of us to serve our families well, our friends well, and even those that we don't get along with easily. Help us to love them first. Help us to do these things because you shape us and sustain us, not the world. Help us to love and serve well because you hold us in your hand and you will never let us go. May we know the voice of our great shepherd and follow him in all that we do. May NGPC be a community of servants, other focused. Thank you for your word this morning and thank you for Darren who preaches it each and every week. Bless him as he prepares for a new series. Bless Seb as he prepares for preaching next week as well, we pray. May that preparation go well. We look forward, Lord, to having a, um, a church that is, uh, that is full of deacons, but also deacons in an official capacity. And we pray, Lord, your blessing upon that process as it approaches. We think, Father God, of our nation today, uh, our state of Victoria, the state of New South Wales, uh, that are in lockdown this morning, where in New South Wales, lockdown uh, keeps getting extended. The, uh, the pandemic seems to be growing and growing. And there are many this morning, be it in our community, at NGPC, be it in um, Melbourne or in New South Wales that are struggling with this. It, it really, uh, it really sucks. God, and we lament this morning at the situation and we pray that you would give us strength to persevere. You would help many of us who are facing mental fatigue, facing pressure. May we be good at monitoring how we're feeling. Uh, may we be good at reaching out for help. May we be good at offering help to others. May we monitor our own habits of things like doom scrolling or you know constantly looking at news feeds and things that can affect us negatively help us instead to turn to your word to seek out refreshing life giving thirst quenching words of you our living god may this church may other churches in our region be great places to turn to even if it is on a screen um, and in person when we're allowed back um, May our communities, despite the choppiness of, of this season, may our communities be thriving, Lord. These, these Christian communities, these churches, we think of Bano and Geelong West and, and Ballerine, Nalee and, and here as well. And we pray, Lord, that we would be still community. We would still be engaging well with one another. For those on their own and isolated, we pray your blessing upon them. May they know your love. And we pray, Lord, that the the shaking up of the nation through such moments like this, that it would draw many to you and they would seek you out and, and the refreshment of the gospel would be theirs. We think, Lord, of, uh, of those amongst us um, individually. We think of Bob this morning. We pray, Lord, that you would be uh, helping him to uh, recover well and settle in well to his new care facility. We pray, Lord, your blessing upon him uh, and, uh, and his, uh, his family as well, Lord. We pray, Lord, that uh, you would be blessing the families here at NGPC. We think of the McGilvery family, the McKnights and the Mallows and the Middletons this morning. We thank you for each of them. We thank you that you've made each of them in your image as part of your plan, each individual in that family, but also each family itself. Bless them this morning, sanctify them. May each of them, as a, as a family and each individual, know your grace and your love 
and that you were their rock. We pray, Lord, that you would be helping Margaret and Joe at this time. May Margaret know your peace, even in moments of fogginess or uncertainty, we pray. And we ask that the family will be working well together, communicating well, supporting Joe and Margaret in love. We think, Lord, this morning of, uh, of PIM that does great work, uh, inland mission, uh, spreading the gospel. We thank you so much for their uh, equipping uh, ministries. We pray, Lord, for this new one, New Donetsk. We ask, Lord, that you would be um, enabling that ministry uh, so that many would uh, drop in, be equipped as they travel around, be they grey nomads, be they uh, students on a gap year. We pray, Lord, that you'd be... Um, enabling this, the spreading and the sharing of the good news of Jesus through that ministry. We thank you for it. We thank you for the hard work and the often um, uh, what can feel like unrewarding work they are doing. But we pray, Lord, that they would feel encouraged and strengthened uh, as they do that. We think of our wider world, Lord. We're, we're saddened to see of the turmoil uh, in Afghanistan, that the Taliban taking over. And we pray, Lord, that you would be blessing and, and shielding the Christians there. It's, it's an, abhorrent, an abhorrent evil. We look forward to a day when there is no more of this. We look forward to a day when there is no humanitarian crisis. We lament this situation, God. Um, save those that are suffering under tyranny uh, and who are physically and and otherwise devastated may many be turning to you in the face of awful oppression lord not just in afghanistan but right around the world and we we think similarly uh of those in haiti who are recovering from yet another natural disaster please bless that community that nation that's that small but rocked nation we pray lord for the continual uh, growing and thriving of the gospel be it in the mercy ministries that the Dobbies are providing. Bless them, Lord, be it through the other churches in that region. We pray, God, that your kingdom would be growing and that that nation would be rebuilding well. There are a lot of the things going on in our world and it feels really, really big, God. Um, it looks insurmountable. And we're reminded this morning that um, when we fall into thinking you're not actually good or big as we talked about in the children's talk, that um, that's a problem. Help us, Lord, to trust in you, to know well who you are. Shore that belief up in us, we pray, when we are facing problems of lockdown, when we're looking around at our world that is in turmoil. But, yeah, so in our, in our laments, in our praises, in our repentance, may we have a great understanding and knowledge of who you are, that you are a good God, a holy God, a big God, that is eternal and transcendent and sovereign. We lift up our prayers, all of them, in Jesus' name, knowing that you hear us, look after us, our finances, our emotional well-being, our community. And most of us, Lord, we pray, keep us yours. May we glorify you in all that we do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing now our final song this morning, God Be the Glory.
Well, friends, lift up your hearts and receive the blessing of the Lord. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each and every one of you, both this day and forevermore. Amen.